Oh. We are to chapter three in the total eclipse of Nestor Lopez. Previously on Nestor Lopez, we met Nestor, a kid who has had to move from town to town because his dad is in the military. His dad is deployed to, I'm trying to think, is he in um, Afghanistan, I believe, this time? And Nestor's not too happy. His mom is tired. They've had to move in with grandma. They're in some small town, and um, there isn't a lot going on. We do know that Nestor has some special abilities, though. He can talk to animals. So he was in the forest talking to some of the animals on his way to his first day of school. He is not excited about his first day of school. But here we go. Chapter three. Sixth grade at my sixth school. A maze of rusty lockers, creaking doors, and ceiling tiles stained with muddy brown splotches. Luckily, most schools in the United States look exactly the same. You'd think they're prisons until you notice the swings and jungle gym behind the plain brown brick building with small windows. The faded sign outside New Haven Middle School declares, Home of the Fighting Armadillos. The only fighting I've ever seen an armadillo do is against a truck on the highway. And I'm guessing the truck usually wins. We don't have armadillos here, but that would be kind of cool to see one. I've never seen one. All right. Despite my confidence, I soon realized the classrooms in New Haven Middle School must have been numbered with a confetti cannon. My first period class English is supposed to be in room 17, but walking down the hall, I pass room 11, room 3, room 19 in that order. So this will be you guys next year. When you go to middle school, if you go to in-person middle school, you're going to have to run around and try to find your classrooms. Because remember, um, our principal telling you that you'll have seven different classes. Wow. I try to remember the map the school secretary gave me, now folded in my back pocket. I don't want to take it out. I might as well get on the school's PA system and announce, new kid lost and wandering the halls. The faces rushing past me are all busy talking and laughing as they head to class. No one seems to notice me. At all my other schools, at least one kid always took me under their wing the first day. When I started second grade at Fort Lewis in Washington, Jacob Kilmer spent all morning showing me the activity centers in the classroom and telling me wild stories about the art, music, and PE teachers. Eventually, he got tired of my questions and pretended I was invisible. It was just as well because I learned a day later that Jacob had come to Fort Lewis just a week before me, so everything he told me was wrong. I finally find my English class by accident, but my nervous bladder tells me to look for the boys' bathroom instead. There's a slight chance I was too confident last night, snoring away under my freshly unpacked blanket, cardboard boxes still forcing the bed springs to poke my ribs through the mattress. In English, math, and history, the teachers make me stand in front of the room and introduce myself. I briefly consider pulling the fire alarm instead. At least mom will be proud if I earn some points. My introductions are greeted with half-hearted waves and mumbles from kids slumped over in their desks. I probably could have announced that I was Mr. Wet Farts and ridden a llama to school without anyone noticing. After lunch, I sit in my science class, amusing myself while the teacher rambles on about how to calculate density. I sketch Cuervito. Who remembers who Cuervito is? Anybody remember? He's our crow friend, right? He named him Cuervito, means little crow in Spanish. Trying to get the right shade of black for his eyes. A shade of black that says, I have made it my brief life's mission to annoy the news kid as much as possible. Apparently I'm concentrating more on my drawing than on dividing mass by volume. Now my science teacher, Mr. Humala, is standing over my desk, oh, craning her long neck. She stretches her jaw and sticks out her lips. Her long red nails twitch as if she wants to snatch my drawing and crumple it into a tiny ball. Mr. Ah, she pauses, searching her brain for my name. Have you ever noticed how teachers in books are always horrible people? Like really, are all teachers horrible people? Mr. Lopez, you really do need to pay attention. Focus, please. She snaps her fingers and walks back to the front of the room. I go back to my drawing but look up periodically to check that Mrs. Humala isn't about to assault me with her spit to get my attention. I'm sitting in the last row, so it's easy to keep an eye on everything. When I walked into class after lunch, I scanned the room and chose a seat in the back, like always. I figured I was doing the teacher a favor. That way she won't have a gaping seat in the middle of the room when I leave again. 
Oh, look, we have an artist in class. I hear a voice say behind me. Just don't pet me or pick me up or feed me leftover tater tots from the cafeteria, please. Ooh, who do you think's talking? I'm guessing it's an animal. I turn and see a large cage in the corner of the room. Peeking out from blue fabric hammock strung between two corners of the cage is a small gray chinchilla. You guys ever seen a chinchilla? You won't have to worry about me, buddy. I won't be here long, I whisper. Wait, you can understand me? Well, just don't go talking to any animal, of course, especially animals you don't know, the chinchilla says, her tiny claws gripping the edge of the hammock as her large black eyes peek over the fabric. Between the attempts by the raven, the deer, and the rabbit to give me advice on my first day of school, I'm fine not talking to any other animals, thank you very much. But Miss Humalot drones on about MOVED, her acronym for finding density. I already know mass over volume equals density because my science teacher at Fort Hood covered it last month. This happens to me a lot. Either I already learned what the teacher is covering or the class is five chapters ahead of where I left off at my old school. I draw a thought bubble above Cuervito in my notebook and he thinks moved again, moved again. The formula might as well be mundadon otra vez e un desastre. Not that moving again is always a complete disaster. It's more like a tornado you know is going to make a direct hit at least every two years, uprooting and flinging you in an entirely new place against your will. So, you know, a disaster. I notice the kid next to me, his eyelids drooping as his pencil rolls out of his hand and across his desk. He's oblivious to the three green peas resting in his curly black hair. I hear a chuckle and a snort to my right and notice a freckled boy with a shaved head. He has four peas lined up on his desk, out of Miss Humala's sight and ready to flick at the sleeping kid. You meet a lot of kids when you go to so many different schools, but no matter the school, the groups are the same. There is always the nose pickers, the hyperventilating hand raisers, the PE Olympians. Evidently New Haven Middle School has the pea flickers. I noticed this vegetable flinger when I walked into class because he had on camo pants and a patch from the third corps based out of Fort Hood sewn on his backpack. I started to sit by him thinking I'd found another military kid, but then I realized that his blue tiger stripe camo was from the Air Force and that on his backpack was a blue patch with a large red one on it from the 1st Marine Division. No one in their right mind would mix Army, Air Force, and Marine Corps. He probably got it all at a military surplus store. The only thing more annoying than actually being a military kid is people who pretend to be military. Dad says being a soldier is a lot more than having a gun and wearing camo. He always shakes his head at men who play soldier. Having been the new kid five times, I've suffered my share of bullies and goons. I kick the sleeping boy's desk and he straightens up yawning and wiping his eyes. He looks at me through half closed eyes and I brush my fingers through my hair to alert him to the vegetable accessories in his hair. He shakes his head and the peas fall on the ground. I notice the pea flicker scowls at me as I shrug my shoulders. The half awake boy mumbles, thanks, and rests his chin on his hand. Miss Humala recites mass over volumes equals density over and over, and my eyelids start to droop again. From the front of the classroom, Miss Humala claps, her long red nails looking like bloody talons. All right, pair up and practice finding density with your partner. I groan. A new kid's absolute favorite thing, finding a partner on the first day. Miss Humala should just go ahead and spit on me. I scan the classroom. The pea flicker is definitely out. He's still scowling at me, his freckles, fiery red meteors across his face. A girl's sitting in front of me, but she's hunched over her paper, tears dripping down onto the equations. I don't think I should bother her. Everyone else in class seems to have paired up faster than drooling high schoolers at prom. I drum my ink-stained fingers on my desk, expecting to complete the problems by myself. Then I feel a nudge on my arm and the drowsy boy nods at the board asking, you wanna? I draw, oh, I shrug. We look at the six problems on the board. The kids around us scribble on their pages and argue. The boy takes a deep breath and says, what'd you get? I don't wanna show off, but I don't need pencil and paper to figure out the problems. 32, 55.25 and 54, I say answering the first three questions. The boy stretches his arm above his head and twirls his pencil in his long fingers. 27, 72, and 16.5, he says, answering the second set and smirking. I chuckle. 
He leans toward my desk and looks at my sketchbook. Wow, that's really good. I want to tell him that I drew it from real life and ask him if all the Ravens in New Haven are this obnoxious. But I've already got being the new kid going against me and I don't need to make myself sound any weirder. Thanks, I reply. New, huh? The boy asks. I'm Taleb. He gives a weak wave. I notice band-aids on three fingers. I'm Nestor, I tell him. I look around and notice that most of the class is furiously pounding buttons on their calculators. I moved here from Fort Hood. You in the army? Taleb asks as he turns his calculator upside down, attempting to write words with the numbers. My dad is. He's an explosive ordnance disposal specialist. That means he disarms bombs, I explain. Is he working right now? I sigh. Here it comes. Yeah, he's in Afghanistan. There's always an awkward silence after this, a mumbled excuse before I'm on my own again. But Taylor puts his calculator down and whispers, is it true that military bases have underground tunnels networks for transferring kidnapped aliens? Uh, I don't think so. Can you buy rocket launchers at the grocery store? They're usually sold out, I smirk. Don't kindergartners have to complete wilderness survival training? I got a blue ribbon on the Tower of Death Ropes as a six-year-old, I tell him, stifling a laugh. The army should hire you to write their recruitment brochures. Caleb slaps his desk and laughs, earning us a hard stare from Miss Humala. I point to the Band-Aids and I ask him, you trying to house train your tiger? Caleb gives a slight smile and runs his fingers through his hair. Another pee falls out. He sighs. Me? No, not really. My dog ran away a couple nights ago and I've been looking for him out in the woods. There's a lot of thorns out there, he chuckles. I'm showing Caleb some of my other drawings. When he flinches and says, hey, he rubs the back of his neck and reveals fingers covered in butterscotch pudding. The pea flicker has upgraded. He cackles at Caleb showing crooked teeth. Caleb looks toward the front of the classroom, but Miss Humala is oblivious. Uh, hunched over another desk muttering, mass over volume, not volume over mass for the fifth time. The crying girl in front of me, Maria Carmen, I think, passes Caleb a tissue and then goes back to whispering. We woke up this morning and the goats were all gone. When I fed them last night, they were all fine. All we found were tracks leading off into the trees. I know it's still out there, just waiting to take something else. Ooh, we're starting to hear that something in the woods is taking animals, a dog and now some goats. I'm never walking through the woods again, I hear Maria Carmen whisper. She takes something out of her pocket and shows it to the girl, a bright pink tag with the number five on it. It's the same as the tags I found in the woods, except those have a three and an eight on them. I'm still not sure what they are. My first day of school has landed me in a tornado of weirdness. That's Brandon, Caleb says, nodding to the pea flicker as he wipes the pudding from the back of his neck. I can't stand that baboon. Yeah, I don't think he's too high on my list either. Maybe on a list of who'd like to see pecked by ravens, but I don't mention that to Caleb. I close my sketchbook and feel two wet globs hit me on the cheek and forehead. Brandon cackles and slaps his hands together. I wipe the sticky pudding off my face, swearing, uh, smearing it on my blank science worksheet. First days at new schools are about as great as finding a fingernail in your hamburger, but this pudding throwing, pee flicking fake soldier is making today one of my worst ever. Gentlemen, what exactly is going on, Miss Humala says as she stands in front of Caleb, snapping her neck at the pudding thrower and then me. War of the pudding cups, I mumble under my breath. Miss Humala looks at me. You'd better clean up in the bathroom, she says before I'm watching over to Brandon. She seems more upset that I smeared pudding on her precious worksheet than the fact that it was thrown at me by boot camp dropout in the middle of class. I scowl at Brandon's camo pants as, he, as I head for the door. He mutters, fire for efficiency and sneers at me. It's fire for effect, moron, I mutter. What kind of mess up town has mom dragged me to? How can abuela live here between pudding assaults, obnoxious ravens, and whatever's in the woods that has Caleb and Maria Carmen freaked out? I'm feeling sorry that I corrected mom when she took the wrong exit off the interstate. I should have just let her keep driving straight into Mexico. Chapter four, dun, da da da. So that's it for today, friends. We've got um, problems coming up. Yes, sir. I have another 